Good morning and good day for everybody joining us, to everybody joining us this morning or today. My name is Helen Balderrama and I'm the Director of Global Engagement and Partnerships at York International. I welcome you all to the Knowledge Fair of the Go Global SDGs in Action Student Challenge year 2022-2023. With me today are our colleagues, our students and our faculty mentors and partners who have been involved in the project. Before we proceed with the program, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We do this to honor our indigenous communities and peoples in Canada who have been here in this land before us. As this knowledge fair is virtual, we are not all gathered in the same space. I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask that if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede its establishment. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Next slide, please. And so I want to just give a very quick introduction uh, or an overview of what had happened this past few months. As I mentioned, this is the second year we are implementing this project, which is funded by the Government of Canada's Global Skills Opportunity Program. This year, we are tackling or discussing with our students and faculty members five SDGs, SDG 1, 3, 6, nine and 17. We started the year in the fall talking and organizing ourselves for some knowledge-based training and workshops to develop and refresh our knowledge about these SDGs. And then our student groups have proceeded to create their action projects during the last two or three months. And today we are here this is our knowledge fair and the idea is we wanna share what have, what have the students been up to and their contributions to the SDGs initiative. Next slide, please. And I just wanna give a sense of the people or the individuals who have, who have been involved or are involved in the program. In total, we have more than a hundred participants so these are our student participants from both York University and our partners. So as you can see here, we are represented by six to seven countries. Um, we also have 23 faculty and SDG mentors, also quite diverse coming from different country countries or our partners from other countries, of course, our York faculty members. Um, most of them or many of them are joining us this morning. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge that this is a York University initiative. And so while York International is coordinating and facilitating this initiative or the activities around it, we are very much supported by our colleagues from the different faculties. And again, they are here with us today and you will be seeing them as the groups present um, moving forward. Thank you, and I think it's over to you now, Anna. Thank you so much, Helen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Martinez. I am the Associate Director for the Las Nuevas Ica campus in Costa Rica. Um, we are very excited to share the projects with you. The students have been working really hard to get to this point. And as you can see, uh, the topics this year are quite diverse. They are located in different 
uh, geographical uh, spaces. Uh, some of the projects were developed based on particular interests and or expertise uh, from one or more um, group members. And other projects were developed as identified by uh, needs from the community or after consultations and conversations with local communities, that is, as it is the case of um, the first aid program for remote communities in Costa Rica. But I don't want to say too much because we're going to hear from the students next. And so uh, we want to welcome you. Please ask the questions on the chat. And we will have time after a few presentations uh, for questions and answers. And so if we can start with the uh, videos, thank you. I believe it's Katie's, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Oh, can you, okay. Um, all right, so our first group that we have up today is um, a group that has done a project on biostimulants, a sustainable solution for agriculture, and they have focused on SDGs 8, 9, 12, and 17. I don't think we are hearing the sound of the video. Oh, the sound is still not on. Apologies, we're just running into an issue here. While Grant is um, trying to figure out the video, I just wanted to share that, as you will have noticed, um, I mentioned the five SDGs this year. However, our students actually took the initiative to also connect some or many of these projects with other SDGs and acknowledging, of course, that SDGs as we contribute to them are very interconnected. So I just want to acknowledge that and, you know, celebrate the students' thought process. Good day, everyone. Good day, everyone. I welcome you all to this presentation where we explore biostimulants as a sustainable solution for agriculture and their impact on the UN SDG goal. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. Biostimulants can help in achieving several of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by promoting sustainable agriculture and reducing environmental impacts. Research was conducted keeping in mind biostimulants impact on these goals. In recent years, there has been growth in the market of biostimulants, substances used in agriculture to improve plant growth and health, improve nutrient uptake, and increase tolerance. In contrast to synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, which have led to several negative environmental and health impacts, including soil degradation, water pollution, and human health risks, biostimulants offer more sustainable and natural approach, as they can promote natural processes that enhance soil fertility and plant nutrition, among other benefits while reducing environmental impacts. This project aimed to better understand the impact and growth of biostimulants, and this report will outline the methods used, results, and challenges encountered during the project. Our team developed a project methodology that would allow us to get in-depth insight into understanding the biostimulant um, market environment, as well as the impact on societies and the environment of this sector of the agricultural sector of the economy. We 
initiated much of our work through desktop research in order to get a comprehensive understanding of country market environments, as well as understanding the nuances between these markets within Central America and the Caribbean. Next, we were lucky enough to be able to have access to a range of suppliers and distributors and academics who have in-depth knowledge of the biostimulant space. Our research indicates that the main crops grown in the countries we are looking at have significant exporting potential as they are in high demand in some of the world's largest markets. However, we have also identified a key challenge in these countries, overused land and decreasing soil fertility. This presents an opportunity for biostimulants to improve soil health and increase agricultural yields, which adds on to the overall sustainability. We have identified Costa Rica, Dominic Republic and Panama as potential growth markets for agricultural products and technologies. These countries have a competitive advantage due to their favorable geographic location and climate. The labor situation in these countries is diverse, with many individuals leaving their home countries for better economic opportunities in nearby regions. However, Costa Rica has become the preferred destination for immigration due to its political stability and economic opportunities. The presence of some of the world's largest agricultural exporters in Costa Rica makes it an attractive destination for individuals seeking opportunities in the agricultural industry. Biostimulants are becoming popular for supporting crops like pineapple, root vegetables and tubers. Best sellers are Protiferrate LMW, Protiferrate K and Stimplex. The market is shifting from collagen based to vegetable based biostimulants, which can be considered as a sustainability related shift. Direct selling to end consumers with low turnaround time is the best way to increase profitability sustainably. Challenges include inconsistent results, inadequate research and validation, and difficulties in determining optimal application timing. Adoption may also be limited in developing countries due to the lack of awareness about biostimulants. Language barriers in target geographies pose challenge in conducting research, but we were able to overcome it. Overall, Understanding the similarities and differences in the crops and labor situation in these countries can provide valuable insights to expand operations and enter into new markets. The need for sustainable agricultural practices and the use of innovative technologies should also be taken into consideration. Based on the above discussions, we came up with recommendations focusing and targeting different SDG goals. With these recommendations, we redefine productivity in the company's value chain and help create a sustainable and strategic action plan. Implementing an information exchange system to improve knowledge transfer to end consumers, especially farmers, to use the products timely and efficiently was one of our recommendations. Through, the, through this innovation in its infrastructure, the company can improve customer retention and help develop a sustainable ecosystem. Further, exploring vegetable-based biostimulants and reducing reliance on microbial stimulants will further help the company take steps towards responsible sourcing and production. With this business very much dependent on partnership with end consumers and distributors, on-ground support from this company will be a part of this sustainable contribution. In the long term, we will be recommending the company to explore technical partnerships and create sustainable agriculture solutions in less developed regions of Latin America, driving economic growth. Through these, we hope that the company will be able to make meaningful contribution to the environment and society as a whole. Thank you all for taking the time and going through the presentation with us. Now we are happy to take any questions. Right. Thank you to our first group for that wonderful presentation. Our second group has focused on SDGs 2, 8, 12, and 14, and they've prepared a project on sustainability in the fishing industry. Hi. Today our group will be presenting sustainability in the industry in the fishing industry as part of the SEG in Action Student Challenge. As part of this project, we have been assisting a company in Costa Rica called Martech to achieve some of its goals in relation to sustainability. The following is a brief uh, summary that we have made. Martech runs several initiatives to promote sustainable fishing practices and production of quality and ethical seafood. Our client sources wild catch from line fishing while emphasizing mature catch and reducing bycatch of endangered species. Consumers are able to support sustainable seafood and companies have proved their willingness to protect the ocean. 
Retailers and wholesalers have adopted sustainable seafood policies by working with partners like OceanWise and Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch programs. We recommend the company to invest in customer education on sustainability efforts, improving traceability, and promote sustainable aquaculture to achieve some of the set out SDG goals. Martech was founded in Costa Rica in 2021. It is a producer in sustainable wild and farm seafood that was born with over 40 years of experience. It farms tilapia and roast snapper, and for its wild catch, yellowfin, tuna, mahi, mahi, swordfish, grouper. It has more than a thousand direct employees, more than 3,000 fishermen in collaboration, as well as 500 small businesses that, that it works with. What are Martek and its SCG initiatives? Its main SCG goals that, uh, that it's achieving are the life below water and responsible consumption and production, but as well as goals number two and eight, zero hunger and decent work and economic growth. This is done through the investment in traceability and certifications, fishery improvement projects in Costa Rica and Panama, community and suppliers development and support, as well as no fishing of endangered species and in marine protected areas, and line caught with circular hooks from artisanal fishing boats. The sustainable seafood industry has also implemented various initiatives to tackle challenges such as bycatch and ETP ratio, minimum sizes, plastic packaging, fish waste, and greenhouse gas emissions. By conducting both audits, the industry has determined compliance with releasing ETP species and has incentivized better practices with over $130,000 through PESCA Plus certifications benefiting over 600 crew members and boat owners. Similarly, fishermen have been trained and incentivized to comply with minimum size regulations, leading to behavior change among 25 boats, benefiting over 80 crew members and boat owners. The industry has also reduced plastic packaging through a closed-loop reverse logistics reutilization cost model and improved the shelf life of seafood products, reducing carbon emissions by $180,000 tons. Martex, uh, also has challenges to achieving greater sustainability, however. Uh, first of all, a leader in sustainable initi initiatives through projects like Pesca Plus, Martech seeks to implement more initi initiatives to decrease carbon foot footprint, improve the environment around it, and make an impact in its communities. To do so, a thought to implement new initiatives that it hopes to monetize to, to wholesalers in its main market, the United States, to acquire pre premium price. This reflects not only Mark's commitment to sustainability, but also allows it to increase its revenues through these premium prices. The sustainable seafood industry faces challenges such as the lack of traceability in the supply chain, which can lead to illegal fishing practices. To address this, stakeholders and policy makers can implement robust traceability systems using blockchain or DNA testing to create a more transparent supply chain. Consumer demand for sustainable seafood can drive change, but many consumers are not aware of the impact of their choices. Retailers, restaurants, and seafood companies can increase awareness of sustainable options through labeling and marketing. Aquaculture is an increasingly important source of seafood production, and to promote sustainability, investment in environmentally friendly practices and certification schemes is necessary. The following is our bibliography. Thank you for listening to us. All right, thank you to our second group. So um, our third group has focused on SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, with their project, Aquifer Water Sanitation Global Case Studies. Hello, everyone. This is group three's presentation for the UN SDGs in Action Competition. We are group three, and this is our case study for SDG six, number six. The group members, are Alicia, Manat, myself, Dominic, Bassett, and Alexis, and our mentors are Elia Abayo and Mark Terry. As with me right now, I am with Alicia to talk more into our case study. Okay, so our SDG goal six is related to clean water and sanitation. Our target is 6.1, which is by 2030 to achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water, and as well as 6B, which is the support and strengthen uh, and participation of local communities in improving water and sanitation management. So we've created a um, 
grassroots organization called Aquifier. This is just a name that we've come up with. And our idea was that Aquifier is an Ontario-based grassroots organization with a mission to inspire and engage other community groups across Canada to kickstart their journey to educate others about the SDG Goal 6. So we've used some tools to create a toolkit for other organizations to use in order to share information about SDG 6 with their own group or their own audiences, and we'll speak more about that. So we've decided to create a Sway document. Um, so you can see it here in the video. Um, so a Sway document is a tool through Microsoft Office, and it almost looks like a website. So um, it's kind of an easy tool to use where anybody that owns it can go in and edit it. So it would kind of work like a, like a working document. And each group member worked on a case study in regards to SDG 6. And the infographics were posted onto the Microsoft Sway document. And um, the idea is that members can continue to add to case studies or add new case studies. And then the uh, document can be shared or uh, infographics can be um, saved and shared with their own groups. And then at the bottom of the page, we have uh, tools for groups to use and share. Along with the Sway document, we also decided to use a form of social media, which in this case, we're using uh, Instagram. Our group decided to use Aquafire as a means to spread information. And so we used a professional account in Instagram, as you can see to the left, to indicate all the number of people we managed to come in contact with and how much those people have reciprocated back with us. Along with our social media, we also made a lot of infographics related to our cause in UNSDG 6. And we're able to uh, advocate all of our points of the Sway document onto our social media point. And you can see all of our posts there when you go to Aquifier today, and you can see all the information and all the projects we have been working on until now. And finally, um, there's a lot of text on this slide, but it's taken directly from our Sway document. And our idea is that this part is to provide groups with action items based on the case studies. Um, so the first is to learn and stay informed, taking our case studies, doing your own and keeping up with the global initiatives. Next is speak up. So this is Ontario based and it can be confusing for um, who to speak to about certain issues, but there are a lot of great outlets to express concerns to speaking up to your MP or MPP or your mayor about certain issues. And so kind of providing people with um, the contact information and, and how to do this. Um, and then there is get involved. So a lot of grassroots organizations function on volunteers and inconsistent uh, grants. So being able to offer your time or your resources um, within your capacity is always very helpful. And then finally is to live a water conscious lifestyle. And that's just looking inward and um, keeping SDG um, six in mind when um, you're cleaning, um, taking care of yourself, drinking water, etc. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for listening. All right, uh, thank you to group three. So uh, our next group up is uh, focused on SDGs 1, 2, 3, 10, and 17. And they've prepared a project uh, about the Madawaska Valley Food Bank website improvement project. Welcome to our presentation for the Madawaska Valley Food Bank Website Improvement Project for the Go Global SDGs in Action Student Challenge. This is for Group 4, which included myself, Colin Maitland, Heba Sandu, Gurjeet Tour, Navanita Majumder, and Jose Ignacio Reyes. Our mentors were Sadia Malik and Kevin McKinney. Food insecurity is defined as a temporary or permanent lack of consistent access to the four pillars of food security. Those four pillars being availability, access, utilization, and stability. According to Statistics Canada, 
One in six, or about 1.15 Canadian youth under the age of 18, are affected by food insecurity, and it continues to rise every year. We decided to look at food insecurity as a problem that we wanted to help solve. Food insecurity is a worldwide problem in a wide range of different countries. Food banks are on the front lines of trying to eradicate food insecurity. They are in need all over the world and are crucial to many communities. Our initiative to create a website for a food bank was our way of increasing exposure, marketing, and accessibility to the local community and the world at large. Through our project, working on the Madawaska Valley Food Bank website, we realized that we could touch on many social development goals, such as no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, reduced inequalities, and partnership for the goals. We decided to work with the Madawaska Valley Food Bank in Barry's Bay in Ontario. This community is in the decline of the population and a majority of its citizens rely on uh, services from the government in order to get by. The Madawaska Valley Food Bank has been open since 1991 and has a, had a direct impact on the community and local towns outside of Barry's Bay. Each time they're open, which is twice per month, they serve approximately 105 families and 230 individuals. With direct collaboration with the committee of the Madawaska Valley Food Bank, we were able to determine their needs and apply them to the website that we created. We created a donation platform and a registration system for a pickup scheduling service at the food bank. By working out a budget and reaching out to various nonprofit organizations, we were able to obtain a vast amount of knowledge and we were able to allocate our resources to what we needed to in the best way we could in order to optimize what we could do for the website or the food bank. Much like every website, there is a initial stage of publishing the website, but a website will need to have ongoing maintenance, which some of our members have volunteered to stay on board to help the community and to be able to ensure a smooth transition with the committee at the food bank. Through working with Wix.com, we were able to create a nice layout for the food bank website, as you can see on these screenshots below. And this is the website that is currently published. We were thrilled to work with Paul Thompson and the team at Madawaska Valley Food Bank. We are very appreciative of them allowing us to work with them. And we couldn't have asked for a better a better organization to work with for this website. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We hope you enjoyed it. Okay, amazing. So our next group up has focused on SDGs 3 and 17 with their project Promoting Helpful Attitudes, Harm Reduction and Drug Use in the Philippines. Good day, everyone. Our group's presentation is titled Promoting Helpful Attitudes, Advocacy Project for Harm Reduction in the Philippines. So drug use is a significant issue in the country, with around 4.8 million people using illegal drugs in 2019. This manifests in increased rates of drug-related crime, 
the transmission of infectious diseases such as HIV and overdose deaths. However, harm reduction approaches do not receive political support. Some prominent figures are even actively contributing to stigma. Vicente Sada III, former senator and former Senate president, described harm reduction as a Western approach, incompatible with the country's beliefs and values. He compared giving clean syringes to people who inject drugs to giving clean knives to murderers. Local and global attempts to reduce the supply and demand for drugs have not reduced the overall number of people who use drugs. This poses a threat to public health, as the use of shared injecting equipment carries a high risk of HIV or hepatitis transmission among users. Our group believes that health is a human right, but people often forget that people who inject drugs also deserve proper and adequate health care. Harm reduction approaches enable human rights, and implementing them is necessary to end HIV transmissions, late HIV presentations, and preventable HIV-related deaths. So with that said, our goal is to leverage our competencies in website creation, writing, global health, literature reviews, leadership, and advocacy to support positive public perception on HIV harm reduction interventions in the Philippines and globally through engagement of youth as a future generation of opinion leaders and change makers. Harm reduction is a holistic and evidence-based approach to public health aimed at reducing the negative outcomes of drug use on individuals, groups, and communities. This method recognizes that the reasons why people start using drugs are complex and often linked to inequities and that they may not be able to remain abstinent. Our project is relevant to Sustainable Development Goal number three, Good Health and Wellbeing, as well as number 17, Partnership for the Goals. We created a website to host our deliverables. Here we made a briefing note as a resource written in accessible language that is advocating for the increased awareness and implementation of harm reduction strategies in the Philippines. Harm reduction services directly benefit people who use drugs, their families, and the community as a whole. This briefing note acknowledges the colonial legacies that have influenced the current approach to drug use and provides a summary of the evolution of drug use and public opinion towards it. This note also critically evaluates the successes and challenges associated with harm reduction in the Philippines and makes recommendations for future efforts. This briefing note serves as a resource for individuals and organizations interested in understanding the role of harm reduction in addressing drug use and related issues in the Philippines. Along with it, we also have a link towards resources as well as an advocacy letter. All of our deliverables utilize plain language to make it accessible to diverse stakeholders, as well as people first language so that we're emphasizing the person rather than the addiction. We created a guideline on how to create and use advocacy letters as a tool for communicating with policymakers. The process of creating our project is as follows. As we had a member based in the Philippines, they were able to educate us on the issue of drug use in the Philippines and that the stigma surrounding it is only increasing the issue. So we chose that as our topic and we engaged in a literature review in which we also compiled resources we found useful in our search such that they could be accessible on the website as Jimmy described. We synthesized our research findings and initially our goal was to draft a policy brief. A policy brief is a document which is typically shown to policymakers to inform their decision making. However, we quickly realized that we are not necessarily ex subject experts in harm reduction, but that we are experts in that we are able to work with our peers. And so our theory of change is that peer-to-peer -peer awareness on the benefits of harm reduction will, will form a positive perception, a positive public perception of harm reduction as a policy strategy. And so the public support of youth as an electorate will eventually increase political will to establish and sustain these harm reduction pro programs, which we know are so useful as seen in the evidence. Again, we have a harm reduction toolbox with the briefing note, the web page, and the advocacy letter. We did consider the sustainability of the project. Ideally, we are going to have a roundtable discussion with the development studies students in various campuses in the University of Philippines in both the bachelor and master's level. Secondly, our goal is to promote advocacy through letter writing for not only harm reduction, but also all issues.
Okay. Um, all right. So our next group uh, has focused on SDGs 1 and 3 with their project Low Cost Medical Services Database, the connections between homelessness and health. Hello, and welcome to the presentation about SDG Group 6. Um, we are working on SDG number three, Good Health and Well-Being. And our project is a website to bridge the information gap between low-cost medical service provider and those in need. Um, the main catalyst for this project was the identification of a, a gap between public health care coverage in Canada and uninsured individuals, particularly immigrants, who cannot access that level of care without um, without paying money that oftentimes they don't have. And also about, in for a lack of information on dental and mental health consultation. Um, as such, we devised a literature review and a website structure that will be covered in the following slides that will provide easy access to information on non-governmental organizations that are providing services, um, how they are, how much they cost, what's their accessibility, and specifically what service do they provide, which is a a lack, which was, there was a lack of information um, identified on websites that did even provide lists of these kinds of services. There was, it was simply a general overview that a place existed and not necessarily a detailed uh, account of what services were provided. We also tried to approach the um, display and conveyance of the information in order to make it appropriate for uninsured individuals who oftentimes do face a social stigma about not having health insurance or not being of a certain social status or financial status or immigration status. Um, and yes, so all that information will be covered in the following slides. And thank you for, thank you for listening to our presentation. Our key objective is to improve the well-being of the uninsured people. However, um, we are also not sure whether the uninsured people are not visiting the clinics because of lack of health reasons. So uh, before we go ahead with the website's construction, uh, we are also doing some kind of literature review in order to ensure that um, there is research in the past to support that the information gap is an issue leading to the uninsured going less to the clinics. Uh, we did find some research and one particular one is being carried out in US in 2001 by Kenny and Haley. And uh, based on their research results, um, there are residents in US who never heard of like the uh, programs of Medicaid or CHIP. And the reason is that they believe that their children are not eligible or lacking sufficient information about this program. We believe that this kind of like research results is also applicable to Canada. And in our case, uh, the people in Canada, I mean, the we uninsured the people in Canada is not going to the clinic. It's also because of an information gap. Once we have Establish that the information gap is like one of the key reasons. We start the uh, uh, data gathering process to construct our website. Obviously, the most critical information is coming from the uh, supplier of those low cost medical services. Um, we try to collect information about like uh, basic information uh, on address and telephone number, opening hours, the service provider. But there is also like additional information needed uh, which can facilitate the uninsured people going to visit the clinic. Those include like, for example, whether what kind of language is available uh, to be communicated between the uh, service team and the client. Uh, in particular, uh, some of the 
clients is coming from uh, immigrants. They may not speak uh, English fluently. And uh, as well as like another factors, which is like whether the clinic is accepting new patients. So we try to get those information. If those are not available in your website, we try to get those information for email exchange of, uh, with the supplier. Hello, I'm Ashla Hutchcraft. I am one of the members of the SDG Group 6, and I will be walking through what the prototype of the website looks like. Um, here we have, keep, keep in mind this is still a prototype and it's not the final product, but it's more of a proof of concept. Here we have the landing page which has the website title, which is still to be determined. This is simply a placeholder, a description, a search bar wherein um, the user can enter what kind of website, what kind of service they want. Um, and in the final product, <clears throat> there would be uh, a search page that would pop up when a particular criteria is searched for, and there would be a list of services that match that criteria. Unfortunately, that's difficult to put in unless there is a, um, like a, uh, what is that, a, a framework already built to do that, which usually can only be put in via a subscription service like WordPress or Gravity View. This was made using raw HTML and a service called Web Slides. Um, so the search button does not go anywhere, but it will in the, in the final um, product. To go to the next page um, is a catalog of all the data that has been gathered by the other team members. Here is a just scroll through to find the appropriate entity. It's all the information needed is here, clinic name, operating entity, contact address details. All of it is there and can be sorted through um, or scrolled through. It can be sorted through uh, because this is just a representation of the Excel sheet. But it is easy to find what you want because of the detailed information, which is one of the primary concerns of this database is that there was no info there was no um, website that had such detailed information about what services were offered and what their cost was um, which i'm sure my colleagues have said in their in their slides um, if we scroll to the next page there's credits for the creators and references for the, the links and the image used. Um, it is quite bare bones in the prototype, but in the final product, it would be more interactive and more and better presented, especially the table. But as I said, that can only be done with frameworks and is difficult to do in raw HTML and CSS, um, especially given the time constraints. Thank you for listening. We were able to discover a multiplicity of healthcare services that promote the overall health and well being of care recipients at a low cost. Although we were able to locate medical centers that provide basic health services such as physical examinations, immunizations, dental, and physiotherapy, equally so, we were also able to discover services outside the scope of typical health provisions. For instance, since physical activity contributes to good health, we included low-cost extracurricular physical activities as an inclusion factor within our research. Embedded within these programs are also nutrition-based classes which simultaneously teach children good behavioral eating habits. That way, we are able to comprehensively expand the definition of healthcare to also include sustainable ways that promote the longevity of good health statuses for all.
Although the purpose of this project is to inform future patients of already available low-cost medical services, it does not ascertain nor conform, um, confirm the quality of care that is provided from the recommended services. The reason for this is mainly due to confidentiality purposes. Since we cannot individually obtain a client list from each service provider to perform customer service satisfaction surveys, it is hard to determine whether such suggested services are even recommended by its users. Equally note noteworthy is the fact that many low-cost services are provided on a voluntary basis. Therefore, it is rather likely that each patient visit will be serviced by a new medical physician. This is not an ideal circumstance as it can potentially jeopardize the continuity of care for patients, which can potentially do more harm than good in the long run. Lastly, it It is not uncommon for small healthcare organizations to change locations over time. The reason for this is that funding trends may change the trajectory at which care can be adequately delivered and where that care can be provided. Therefore, if a patient becomes well acquainted with a medical service in Scarborough, for instance, if that same center relocates to Brampton, the problem of physical accessibility can arise as an unfortunate byproduct of relocation. The purpose of websites are to provide web users with access to particular information and or services that they are in search for. The problem with the search mechanism is that many websites exist under particular search items. Therefore, it is quite common for well-intended websites with useful information to have low engagement in terms of its user traffic. Considering this, we believe that accessibility towards our website can be enhanced via search engine optimization tactics where we hire a person who specializes in coding that can make our website SEO friendly. That way, with the simple search of low-cost services in Toronto, we can then ensure that our website will be listed on the first page of a Google search. Another way to increase traffic to our website would be to distribute brochures at all immigration offices located in Toronto so that future patients can receive basic information from the informational templates and therefore be referred to the website for further information. In addition to this recommendation, since one in four people in Canada was a landed immigrant as of 2021, it is a logical assumption that language barriers can also pose as an accessibility issue. Therefore, the usability of our website can be further optimized by embedding a translation engine on our main page. Hey, wonderful. So that is the first half of some amazing presentations so far. I want to invite Professor Theo Peridis to help us with the Q&A portion. So if you have any questions for our panelists today, whether you are a guest or a fellow student or staff, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Theo, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mary Rose. Uh, beautiful presentations, uh, inspiring presentations. Uh, the specificity that we heard is, is, is quite, quite uh, touching in, in so many ways. Uh, we do have a few questions on the line, uh, and I'm sure we will have more as, as people get excited. There's a question that came up <clears throat> that had to do with the low cost uh, medical services. And uh, the question pertains to ways that you have thought about addressing and creating alternatives for people and in communities that, where technology and connectivity is a challenge. Um, I can answer that. Um, Beautiful. As, as a part of the group. Um, yeah, that was a big conversation that we had, um, especially with our colleague in the Philippines. Uh, a big part of what we were wanting to do was to try to bridge the gap both in Toronto and the Philippines. Unfortunately, in that area that our colleague was in, there wasn't a whole integrated database which sparked that conversation. And our 
solution was to, as my um, colleague mentioned in the presentation, try to facilitate the production of flyers or pamphlets that would either direct people to the website in, let's say, an office where they, a uh, doctor's office where they would have a computer that you could use, or even list some of the more, um, what is that, some of the more prominent services, some of the more some of the more um, easily accessed services uh, in that pamphlet. So we'd have, uh, and it, there was an idea that it could be uh, tailored to localities where the pamphlets would exist, but that would be a workload that might be a bit too much. So yeah, we, we did, and uh, yeah, a big part of our, our thought process in the beginning was how to do that. We just realized we didn't have the resources to adequately implement that part of the project at this time. Beautiful, thank you very much. Uh, another question that came up was about the uh, the aquifers. Uh, and, and we would like to hear about uh, the challenges that will come in balancing the needs uh, to development where they need to preserve the aquifers, if you had thought about it. And what does this balancing mean? Um, sorry, I'm actually not sure I understand the question. Um, so in regards to like the word aquifer, it's kind of just um, the, sorry, turn my video on. Um, it's kind yeah. of just the name of our group that we've decided on. Um, Kind of like playing on the word like aquifer um mm -hmm. so is the question specifically about aquifers yes so the um, how do you know the preservation of water the preserve you know where are you going to be doing this have you thought about the challenges what does that mean yeah i think that um of course that the challenge and the issue like spans worldwide um mm -hmm. and we've kind of as a group um at first, we really wanted to make it like an international type of mm -hmm. um, hypothetical organization. And we wanted to look at, because uh, we had group members in the Philippines as well, and looking at the Philippines. And we realized that that is just um, a really big challenge to take on and discuss like the worldwide issue. Um, and so um, Ontario is um, watershed based, so conservation, um, uh, conservation authorities um, in Ontario are given the, the responsibility to take care of like individual watersheds that lead to um, specific lakes around Ontario. And so we just thought that for like, um, it might be more practical for the project to um, have the target audience based in Ontario, but to discuss like the worldwide issue of water management and sanitation. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I think it's more so like, instead of having a group that is specifically on the ground, um, but really taking that step of um, advocacy for clean water and mm -hmm. educating for clean water, because a lot of people um, don't really know who manages what, especially in Ontario, like we mentioned in the, like the what you can do and who you can reach out to, to voice your concerns about water management. A lot of people don't know who those people are to reach out to. And so that's a key thing that our group wanted to do was to connect people to tools in order to take action. Um, if it's not so much as, you know, like going and planting tree or trees near, near lakes, it's, it's sharing information and it's talking to the right people. So that answers Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, a, a question that I guess goes to all the groups and, and it may require you to reflect for a couple of seconds and maybe uh, some of you will be ready with that because you have thought about it. Some of you will want to wait for your answer at the second part of our uh, session. And the question is, uh, if you can tell us specific ways that engaging in this project change your perspectives about the issues of sustainability as a global uh, challenge. The concrete ways though, we don't want the generalities. We want concrete ways that you said, aha, this was a surprise, aha, 
I learned something I really didn't know about, and I'm looking at sustainability in a very different way now. Any one of the groups. I can take a step. Thank you, Ashraf. Go ahead. So one thing I thought of that, that really surprised me, one thing that just jumped out at me was, was that gap of knowledge for, for low cost services. I mean, we think of Canada as a place where everybody should be able to get healthcare, but there's so much of the population that I didn't know about that doesn't get it. And there are places where they can get it, but there's that, that, that gulf and sustainability we think of as you know saving the environment and planting trees and all that but it made me think of sustainability sustainability also in the um light of human sustainability you know we have to keep we have to keep people healthy and and people in good condition our our populations um we have to take care of so that that's sustainable instead of you know proverbially throwing them to the wolves um and it was it was eye-opening to me to see that that there's a whole portion of our society that doesn't have the health care that we think that they do or that they should. That's a beautiful way to say it. And, and it does talk about very much that sort of we take a lot, lot of things for granted. As you say, in Canada, we think we have everybody has access to health care. Everybody's of the same while we're sitting here in Toronto and we have a dozen hospitals and a thousand doctors. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I would like the rest of you to keep that question in mind. Uh, and we would like as, as a reflection and as a reflection of this program to hear more from your perspectives uh, at the end of the second set of presentations. I think at this point, we're just in time. Mary Rose, you want to take over and, and put us into a nice break? Thank you so much. And thank you for those who uh, spoke. Your answers were really wonderful. And it, it truly gave some more light. And thank you for sharing your insights in the projects. Um, so now we'll just move to a short screen break. If you had questions that you didn't have to answer, we do have another Q&A coming up uh, later on. So hold on to those questions, throw them in the chat uh, for our panelists. Keep thinking about those questions, those thought-provoking questions that we've had earlier. So maybe you can speak to them at the second Q&A. Uh, all right, so we'll be back in five minutes to restart. Thank you so much.
Okay, so we are coming back slowly. Uh, thank you and welcome back, everybody. Um, so I'll just now invite Katie Grimmins to come back and introduce the first group coming back. Okay, um, all right, so next up are the, uh, is the group who has done a project on basic first aid program for remote communities in Costa Rica, and they focused on SDGs 1, 3, 9, and 17. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Vachesinka. I'm a student at York University in the Faculty of Health. My colleague is Allison Stacy, also with the Faculty of Health at York University. Our project is called Basic First Aid Program for Remote Communities in Costa Rica. Our, pro our program touches on SDGs number one, three, nine, and 17, as seen on this slide. So what's our idea? Our project hopes to bring basic and emergency first aid training through a non-certificate program, uh, based program to communities in rural Costa Rica. The target population is youth and young adults, and the program will teach CPR, choking, minor injury care skills in order to preserve life in remote areas with delayed medical response. Why are we doing this? Costa Rica has a successful healthcare system, but people living in remote and rural communities have difficulty accessing healthcare services for both emergent and non-emergent issues. Delays in receiving medical attention can cause further medical issues and diminish an individual's or community's autonomy. Having first aid skills is a tool to reinforce the individual and individuals and communities' autonomy and self-determination. So how are we doing this? We have contacted potential partners to collaborate with in order to design a sustainable training program. We have ongoing collaboration with potential training partners, uh, which is important for a strong start and successful pilot program. We've also contacted some partners to donate resources and equipment that we will bring to York University's Las Nubes Eco Campus in Costa Rica. We also need to find a trainer with local knowledge and the correct certifications. So our project breaks down into a five phase plan. Our first uh, phase introduces basic first aid training through a non-certificate program. Our second phase will introduce a more structured and standardized program with emergency and standard first aid through a certification program. Our third phase identifies emerging first aid leaders from the community and trains them as first aid instructors through a non-certificate approach. Our fourth phase will certify these community members as SFA instructors uh, with certification. And our fifth phase will implement wilderness and first aid training. So our first phase will be uh, our pilot program. The first iteration of this program will ideally take place at Casita Azul, the community library connected to York University's Las Vegas Eco Campus. The program will be delivered in two ways, an after school program for the youth and an evening or weekend workshop uh, series for adults. Based on the community's response, the program will be refined through co-creation to employ the most appropriate and relevant teaching methods. Uh, this gives the community say in how the program will proceed and develop. Um, and now what are our short-term and long-term goals? Our first short-term goal is to find a local first aid trainer. Um, we want a local first aid trainer, so this program does not depend on external intervention in the long run. Our second short-term goal is to apply for funding for phase one. Our long-term goals are to amplify voices and confidence of rural communities in Costa Rica that have identified gaps in healthcare response by giving them basic first aid training. Our second long-term goal is that the program will eventually become self-sustaining uh, with local teachers based within the community so the uh, community can run the program themselves. And that's everything about our project. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. All right, thank you to that group for their presentation. Our next group uh, has a project titled Carnes Loma Verde and they will be addressing goals two, three, eight, 
and 12. We are representing the Schulich School of Business at York University, and we're working with Carnes Loma Verde, which, uh, or CLV, which is a meat processing company located in Branca, a region in Costa Rica that encompasses the southern part of the country, including the province of Punta Arenas and part of San Jose. So CLV specializes in producing and distributing high quality meat products, which includes beef and pork, and they process and send the finalized and packaged product to three main customer segments. So it includes schools, which we'll be focusing on today, supermarkets and restaurants. So the CLV mission is to deliver superior quality meats while promoting the welfare of the community and they compete through quality. So not through mass production achieved through economies of scale and factory farming. The ultimate goal is to increase profits without compromising the mission statement. Thank you, Kelly. So one of CLV's three customer segments are, are elementary schools. However, they only supply to 30 schools currently. Our project is aimed at ascertaining how CLV can serve a greater volume of schools and subsequently reduce food insecurity in the country, starting with elementary school children. We developed a plan to reallocate CLV's food supply from restaurants to school programs in a way that satisfies CLV's mission and economic goals while concurrently contributing to this important issue. Our target is specifically to increase the number of schools that CLV provides to by three times in the next five years, thus enabling CLV to realize a profit and advance SDG number two by serving hungry school children through their programs. Supplying high quality meat to schools offers youth healthy meals to support their learning and development. Further, the supply of local meats to schools has the potential to further the economic development of Costa Rica. Increased demand for meat will encourage CLV to access new markets. The long-term impact can stimulate CLV's operations and create new jobs. Our proposal connection to the SDGs include goal number two, zero hunger, goal three, good health and well-being, goal eight, economic growth, and goal, tw goal 12, responsible consumption. Thank you, Rita. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, our methodology. So first we looked at CLV's three market segments, so restaurants, supermarkets, and schools. To determine the most profitable segments, we conducted research. So we looked at secondary sources, financial statements, and we conducted primary research, such as interviews. From there, we were able to divert excess supply to schools. So what did we find? Well, first, high-end restaurants represented the best balance of profitability and quality. We could divert 15% of low-demand products to schools. Secondly, mid-market supermarkets represent the best balance of profitability and quality. We can divert 25% of excess products to schools. Now, schools, most interestingly, there's an agreement with the government and small producers that schools actually provide the highest amount of profitability for CLV. So we can increase the meat supply by 40% by diverting it from other sources and actually make our clients more profitable in doing so, helping to meet their target SGGs. So looking at the challenges, uh, considering CLV is a family owned business, additional resources or additional capital may be required to meet the excess demand. This capital could be required for warehousing, uh, to provide supply chain management, or even to provide logistical support. Similarly, rebranding and accreditation is a timely process and may increase the cost of doing business. And lastly, we believe that Trade terms for some of the sectors are very long, which may, may impact cash liquidity. Now, Austin will tell some recommendations. Thank you. So based on those challenges and the results that Dennis went over there, we recognize that our recommendation for CLV is that we want them to shift their client base towards high-end restaurants and mid-sized supermarkets to benefit from that premium pricing and satisfy the goal of feeding school children with the aim of that 40% food diversion. And we have three key elements that we think and believe are going to get us there. One is that we've provided a client suggestion list of prospective clients that we believe would satisfy a good fit for CLV. Next up, a subsidiary brand that will not only compartmentalize the school side of the business with the other restaurant side of the business, but also benefit from not mixing any sort of marketing messaging. And then lastly, a set of marketing tools such as improved certifications and more colorful and attractive packaging that will allow them to grab the attention of these new prospective clients. Now, these are recommendations that we believe will satisfy these SDG goals. Thank you, and we're happy to take any questions.
Thank you to Carnes Loma Verde. Next up, we have slowing down fast fashion, uh, addressing goal six and 12. Hi, everyone. Um, we are SDG Group 9. My name is Michaela Cordero. I go to York University. My name is Claire West. I also go to York University. Our mentors are Rama Politrara and Professor Patrick Clark, who also go to York University. And our project is called Slowing Down Fast Fashion. Our project aims to raise awareness and encourage an open dialogue about the impact of fast fashion garment manufacturers on the environment and our own individual consumption of their products. Our SDGs are 6 and 12. Uh, SDG 6, clean water and sustainable, uh, in sanitation. Uh, garments made today contain harmful microplastics that are uh, embedded in their fibers. So what are the effects of these microplastics on our water systems? as well as responsible uh, product and consumption. As a material culture, we consume more than what is sustainable for our planet. It is vital to take a hard look at uh, the products and lifestyle of, or in, and life cycle of the clothing uh, we purchase and their impacts on the environment. How can we analyze our own individual garment consumption and how can garment manufacturers analyze their carbon footprint. So what is fast fashion? According to thegoodtrade.com, fast fashion is a design, manufacturing, and marketing me method focused on rapidly producing high volumes of clothing. Fast fashion garment production leverages trends, uh, trend, le trend replication and low quality materials, such as synthetic fabrics in order to bring inexpensive styles to the end consumer. Some examples of fast fashion retailers include online storefronts like Shein or Fashion Nova and brick and mortar storefronts like H&M, Zara, or Topshop. Through our research, we have come to learn that following the oil industry, the fashion industry is the second largest polluter in the world. It deeply angers us that fast fashion has been on the rise, promoting the ethos of expendability and planned slash perceived obsolescence, which has become so prevalent in the 21st century. This fashion phenomenon is a far cry from the centuries-old traditions of creating garments from natural fibers sustainably harvested from the land and the inclination to, to repair damaged garments rather than discarding them completely. So what is the environmental impacts of fast fashion um, garment manufacturing? The carbon footprint is uh, the, uh, responsible for contributing 10% of carbon emissions when it's compared to something like uh, plane and boat carbon emissions, which is only at 5%. Uh, uh, those steps have been made in fast fashion to try to contradict this. Uh, companies like Sheen, H&M, Fashion Nova, and more contribute harmful practices to make uh, it harder to get this number down. Landfills of clothing. Uh, fast fashion brands make big batches of clothing and if they don't sell, they usually put them on a lower cost or just throw them out. As well, uh, things like returns is usually cheaper to throw out for these companies rather than just to recycle them. As well, chemicals and uh, harmful microplastics in clothing. Harmful chemicals have also been found in fast fashion clothing brands. High levels of lead, PFA, and phytosus were found in sheen clothing. Um, Microplastics and uh, fibers of manufactured clothing get into our waters, disperse, and end up polluting them. How can we reduce our individual carbon footprint regarding garments consumption? There are a few things you can do, like thrifting. So shopping at your local charity shop or thrift store is a great way to pick up vintage and contemporary pieces. Oftentimes, these garments are lightly used or brand new with the store tag still attached. Give these pre-loved garments a new home in your wardrobe. Uh, and another thing you can do is upcycling. So if you're feeling crafty, you can uh, tap into your creative side by taking existing pieces in your wardrobe and breathing new life into them. Some projects could involve uh, attaching patches to torn jeans, embroidering an old sweatshirt, or making yarn from old t-shirts. And a third thing you can do is avoid buying into microtrends and only purchasing clothing that you'll actually well wear. Consider the following questions for self-reflection on the next slide. 
So some questions for reflection. Uh, here are some questions to inspire um, your own kind of uh, look into what you do when buying garments. Keep this in mind when shopping. So what materials is this garment made from? Is it made from natural fibers like cotton or synthetic oil-based materials like polyester, which have more pollutants in them? Um, will it this piece last 30 washes or longer? Uh, can this type of material or the seam or stitching uh, be used and withstand multiple washes without falling apart? Um, should, if it will fall apart, is it worth buying? Uh, do I truly need this? Uh, if I wait a week before I revisit the store, uh, will I want, still want to buy this garment? During how many occasions can I see myself wearing it? So some sustainable clothing organizations that we love. Um, there's RAP, which is an organization that encourages users and fashion retailers to reduce their impact uh, their clothing has on the, on the planet. Using an industry-led action plan, they pledge to reduce 15% of water pollution, CO2 emissions, and landfill waste from garment production, as well as decreasing all-waste products by at least 3.5%. And there's Trade, which is a UK-based charity organization that aims to reuse clothes and reduce waste from carbon emis emissions. They also use donations to fund interna yeah. international textile companies to improve conditions and practices in the industry. And there's Good On You, which is a mobile app that is founded on the premise of SDG 12, um, ensure sustainable production and consumption patterns. And it initiates the change in customer behaviors by suggesting ethical and environmentally friendly options on purchasing garments. Um, if you'd like to look uh, into this topic further, um, we have some resources listed down below. These are some of the sources that we looked into for um, our project. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Slowing Down Fast Fashion. Uh, our next project, the connections between homelessness and health, uh, which addresses uh, goal number one. Hello, thank you all for being here. I'm Natasha Advani, thank you. And this is my project aligning with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. My focus is on the homelessness crisis in Toronto, where over 18,000 people experienced homelessness in 2021. Access to adequate housing is a necessity, yet many shelters have multiple issues that make them less functionable and desirable for those in need. This project is directly connected to the sustainable development goal of no poverty, as homelessness is both the result of poverty and a perpetuator of the poverty cycle. Through this project, I will establish and explain the intricate and nuanced relationship between housing and health, mental, physical and social health, the findings of my research through surveys and interviews, scientific journals, government and non-governmental organization reports, as well as news articles from local outlets, will help me identify several factors that discourage people experiencing homelessness from seeking or remaining in shelters. And I will suggest ways to improve these factors along with the limitations of their implementation. Homelessness has a profound impact on mental, physical, and social health. Homelessness can cause or exacerbate mental health problems. The experience of homelessness can be accompanied by feelings of shame, isolation, and hopelessness, further worsening mental health struggles. Unhoused individuals are at a higher risk of physical health problems, not limited to infectious diseases, chronic health conditions, and injuries. The lack of access to basic necessities can lead to various diseases. And since they don't have shelter in a climate such as Toronto, where the weather can get very severe, people at are at higher risk of weather-related diseases. 
People experiencing homelessness face discrimination and stigma leading to social isolation, exclusion, as well as a higher risk of violence. The loss of stable income and a stable home may result in loss of social support networks, exacerbating mental health problems, as well as making people feel as if they don't have anyone to reach out to for help. Here are a few factors that discourage people from seeking or remaining in shelters. Overcrowded conditions can make people feel uncomfortable due to the lack of privacy and personal space. Furthermore, many shelters may not have access to adequate facilities and services, making people reluctant to stay there. There can be many safety concerns in shelters due to higher risk of theft, violence or abuse, specifically for vulnerable groups such as religious minorities, LGBTQIA+, and differently able people. There are a lot of shelters that are also not accessible, making it very difficult for differently able people to move around in the space. Some individuals may be reluctant to use shelters because of the stigma associated with homelessness, leading people to feel extremely ashamed and discouraged from seeking help. Furthermore, there are people who want to seek help, but there may not be sufficient resources in terms of support services to help them improve their situation. Many shelters require people to leave during the day so they can't store their belongings and go to work. Furthermore, the intake and the leaving time may not be compatible with their work hours, forcing them uh, to remain unhoused. So there are ways in which the system can be improved. For example, designating accessible female-only LGBTQIA plus only shelters with employees from the same community to create safer spaces. However, there is a risk that the, these shelters may not be located near the designated population. We can allow people in the shelter so, to support and contribute in its maintenance and cleaning in the case of employee shortage or exchange and, and perhaps exchange wages, providing them with jobs as well which can also cultivate a sense of community and respect for the face for the space um the system can be adapted to make it more work friendly this could mean allowing employed people to enter and exit um, according to their work hours the most important um solution in my opinion would be to combat the stigma about people experiencing homelessness uh, by raising awareness uh, and also engaging in community engagement activities to cultivate a sense of empathy. Um, a huge reason why these shelters have factors that discourage people from remaining in them is because of lack of adequate funding and public support is extremely essential to reallocate government resources to improve um, the homelessness crisis in Toronto. Thank you so much and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for that presentation and next we have uh, the project End Poverty Now uh, addressing goals number one and three. We are group one for the SDGs in Action program, and our project is called End Poverty Now, Equal Opportunities, Equal Outcomes, Ending Poverty and Stigma. Poverty on a global scale has grown at an alarming rate during recent years. This project aims to destigmatize poverty within the context of Toronto through knowledge sharing and promotion of resources. This pamphlet aims to raise awareness about poverty in Toronto, with the intention of taking a proactive approach to end poverty stigmatization. We must ensure that the next generation is well informed. By utilizing our educational and professional experiences in varying fields, we have created a well-informed and comprehensive pamphlet that explains the complex discourse of poverty in a way that is palatable to a wide demographic, including children, adults, and seniors. In this informative tool, we touch on aspects of, the, of poverty, such as the history of poverty in Toronto, poverty in Toronto today, 
the, realization, the racialization and systematization of poverty, poverty and intersectionality, and the next steps to destigmatizing poverty. We conclude by providing resources and tools to financial education, poverty reduction education, and financial aid. Toronto's long history of economic boom and bust has made poverty a historical and persistent issue widespread amongst working class immigrants and refugees. Poverty in Toronto has increased exponentially and has continuously resulted in negative health outcomes. It takes place when the resources needed to supply basic needs are inadequate and are scarce. But to properly understand poverty within the context of Toronto, we must understand that it is a process and not a state. As a horizontal inequality, it refers to inequalities between socially defined groups that often cut across income groups. The best way to measure poverty is, is to use an intersectional approach that includes two important factors that are often overlooked, immigration and age. With over 3 million people, Toronto is one of the most diverse cities in the world due to its large immigrant population that includes a significant number of refugees and children of refugees. Coming to Canada as a refugee is often a more difficult avenue of immigration, and many come with little to nothing, mostly relying on community help and government assistance. Ultimately, this puts most refugees below the poverty line. An aspect of intersectionality within the context of poverty, and often is regarded, is the ageism that takes place as Canada continues to have a growing seniors population. Even those who did it all right, maxed out their RRSP account year after year, paid off their mortgage, and raised financially independent children, are often struggling to keep up with the, with the rising cost of living. The pamphlet aims to raise awareness about the issue of poverty in Toronto, highlighting its history, causes, stigma, consequences, and possible solutions and recommendations. Some of the recommendations for destigmatizing poverty highlighted in the pamphlet include acknowledging the issue. Poverty is a very complex and multifaceted issue that has substantial effects on a significant portion of the population in Toronto. As a society, we need to recognize that poverty is not an individual's lack of motivation or failures, but a systemic issue that arises from various factors, including discrimination, socioeconomic disparities, and in adequate social policies. Second, encouraging open conversations. Third, amplify the voices of those marginalized. Fourth, focus, develop, and advance policy solutions. And finally, support local and community leaders and initiatives. Destigmatizing poverty in Toronto requires a multifaceted approach that involves extensive policy solutions, community and partner engagement, as well as a shift in cultural narratives, by working together, we can create a more just and equitable society for all Torontonians. Through this research, we were able to better comprehend Toronto's existing structural and poverty related gap. By taking the time to destigmatize poverty, we better understood the significance of elevating the voices of those who are marginalized and promoting a more inclusive approach. The creation of the pamphlet was also an important part of the process, and with the research part, it made us a more efficient and stronger team. The Yes, Anna, the video disappeared. So I'm not sure if that's a technology problem. The presentation was cut off. That's the end of the video. Can we put the slides then? Oh, Theo, it's your turn. Thank you. No, I, I, it would be nice to have the slides on, actually, uh, and the summary slides so people remember uh, all the projects. Uh, great presentations, uh, equal in engagement and creativity to the first six we heard on uh, the first part of the session. Great work, guys. Um, some questions that came up. Um, that, that uh, are worth pondering as much as I want to remind us, uh, for all of you, 
the question that was set up in the beginning. Uh, if you can reflect and tell us and share with us how engaging in this project has changed uh, your understanding about sustainability as a global issue. Uh, we did hear from us for some great insight that we would love to hear from the rest of you. Uh, a couple of specific questions about the project. <clears throat> Uh, the, oh, the, we have an answer from Precious. Yes, we have a question from Precious. Hi, sorry. Um, it was an answer to your question about how it um, reshaped our understanding of sustainability on a global level. Great. Go ahead, Precious. Um, I was just going to say that um, our project helped me to understand that it is important to I guess, tackle these issues on a micro level before trying to tackle them on a global level. Um, yeah, that was it. Great, uh, uh, and very, very pointed. We heard the issue of misinformation, lack of information, lack of knowledge that the, about the complexity of the issues and the multiple aspects of it. And another observation, which is really, we can't just be talking about the world. We have to be talking about very specific uh, ways and specific uh, relevant topical applications of the whole discussion of sustainability, if we want to make a difference. Uh, great, thank you, Precious. Uh, happy to be interrupted by others as they have uh, their, the, you know, different perspectives uh, on that. It's very important for us to understand guys uh, how, oh, you know, sort of engaging in this changes you. Uh, this is why we do it. Because we want to see how young people uh, are affected by participating in these kinds of, of projects. Uh, after all, we're an academic institution. Uh, uh, a couple of questions specific to the projects we heard this, uh, the second part. Uh, the End Poverty Now, uh, great initiative, very topical, very much in Toronto. Uh, the, the pamphlet is, is a great job, uh, great design. How do you envision uh, sort of pushing this out? How do you envision uh, creating the community discussions? That, that you were bringing up and identifying as necessary. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was one of the members from mm -hmm. um, the End Poverty Now project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that we discussed, um, if we had a little bit more time, was our distribution mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially we were going to start by going to a lot of the, um, I guess, um, core, I don't know what you would call them, but like the Harriet Tubman Institution, the um, Center for Refugee Studies, um, and so on and so forth. And we were going to ask them to help us distribute um, the pamphlet, the online version. Um, we were going to ask some of our um, faculty members for some of our programs to help us so organized research units, thank you. Um, we were gonna ask them to um, help us with distributing the um, pamphlet, I guess, out to other students. And we were also going to leave physical copies um, around the university um, at student centers, um, possibly the library. We have like a little newspaper stand at like the Scott's um, place and we could just like leave it there and I guess the point of it was not necessarily to create a discussion that we would see, but to create a discussion amongst the community that people can have amongst themselves and to, I guess, yeah, just to create a discussion amongst students that they could have by themselves. Precious, have you given a thought to be more ambitious and go beyond just the student population? If anything else, students, young people tend to be more sensitive, more open to this. Uh, you know, even in school, elementary school, K-12, these discussions are more uh, common today. Is is my, my generation that, that doesn't have that appreciation. Have you thought about going beyond 
the boundaries of the university? Um, yeah, we were really ambitious at the beginning and we wanted to go the K to 12 route. Um, however, we did realize that because of our time limit and because of, I guess, like all the clearances to go to the K to 12 route, it would just mm -hmm. take a bit more time. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing those this, this great ideas with us. Uh, let's shift to the fast fashion uh, group. Uh, we do know that a number of, of uh, fast fashion companies are sensitive also to the issue, whether it is genuine or responding to the consumers. And they're coming up with socially conscious uh, uh, product lines. Um, and, and they're coming up with recycling and all this. Uh, how do you see what you're doing uh, really making an impact above and beyond what the company is already doing. I am from the group. I can speak on that. Go ahead. Um, so I think for especially fast fashion, uh, like something like a company like H&M does have now a recycling um they have new recycled clothing. However, it doesn't account for all of their clothing. So it is very important to actually take a look at the tags and still see if it is the natural fibers or if it's the polyester or exactly what it's made of. If it does follow their line of um, like sustainable practices, because still, even though they have made some slight movements towards it, they still are very large polluters. So it is still mm -hmm. very important to be conscious of exactly what you are buying and what you are mm -hmm. looking into and uh, how everything kind of gets handled. And if it is returned, are those recyclables actually going to be going into recycling clothing and making new clothing? Or are they just putting that up as a front to just throw them out to consider? Uh, Claire, if I, I push you a little more, so that this was as much a reflection and, and your own education about what's going on and the impact that it has. Do you see taking it out? Do you see it spreading it to the community? How do you see that message going out to, to do make an impact to be in bigger numbers? So uh, for me and Michaela, we did have some conversations about different ways that we could like spread it around. We just unfortunately ran out of time to do anything, uh, but we were thinking of uh, maybe possibly making a website or social media. Uh, there was also early talks in our group about making an app that was possible to look into these companies. We just, as a group, didn't have the skill set to do so because we're, we're done we weren't quite sure how to do that so we just kind of had to um figure out our questions but that was definitely an option if we had kind of more time and more kind of knowledge something that we were definitely considering doing let me suggest how you can find more time and resources engage people that they will participate in this program next year and we'll take it to the next step Find some, some of your peers and say, we know that this is important. We know that this is valuable right now. How do we spread the word? How do we make it actionable? Um, and I'm sure, you, you know, York International will support that uh, because it's, it's so important for all of us. As, as you said, the, the waste, the degradation of the environment that goes through fast fashion is enormous and, and individuals don't recognize it. Um, so uh, uh, we need to wrap things up, but I would like to hear at least one or two more reflections about engaging in these projects uh, and, and in the specific concrete ways that has changed your perspective. I see Colin, uh, go ahead Colin. Um, I just wanted to uh, answer Ashley's question. She had a question for the Madawaska Valley Food Bank. Um, she asked, have you thought about how increased exposure of the food bank will increase demand and how the food bank might, in might meet increased demand? Um, thanks for the question, Ashley. Um, so with the increased demand that we would get with the website, we believe it would be offset with the increase in donations now that it is accessible 
um, in the local community online, but also worldwide. Um, we also uh, believe that with the community up in Barry's Bay, that it kind of has a uh, maximum point of, what, of how many people it will help out. So it, it, unless people are traveling vast distances to get to Madawaska Valley, um, there's only so much that is there. And I just wanted to bring up one experience I had while we were researching food banks. Um, one up in uh, in uh, none of it, or Northwest Territory, sorry. They had with their food bank. I'd reached out to them, but on their 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 uh, website, they had uh, T-shirts and stickers for sale, and I ended up buying a T-shirt. So there's a bit of a a connection where I donated, being from Southern Ontario, and helped out a food bank way up north, which was our original intention. So um, I we we're hoping that with this website, we can. Uh, still continuing to work with the group in Madawaska Valley to uh, hopefully open up more avenues where they can bring in more revenue to help other causes. Thank you, Colin. I, I think unfortunately we have run out of time. Any other questions you have or or observations or reflections, please, please, please send them to the group. We'll love to hear from you. Thank you all for the great presentations. Uh, Ellen, Mary Rose to you. Thank you so much, Theo, and thank you so much to all of the students and the student groups and the mentors who have presented. I myself is reflecting on all of these issues, and I think I invite everyone to do the same. We thank you for your engagement and your energy and resources to come together. And so I think at this point of the program, we have come to, I would say, one of the most exciting part. I said one of the most because the exciting pieces as well are the group presentations. But now we come to the awards ceremony. And before that, I would just like to acknowledge the committee members or the awards committee who helped us in looking at the projects and making sure that we recognize the student efforts. So we have Dr. Ian Garrett, who's from our School of Arts, Media of Performance and Design. We have Professor, Professor Ido Buran from our CFAL York, which is one of our research units. And also we have Professor Philip Kelly from Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. I just wanna thank them for their time, um, helping us select the today's awardees. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Ian Garrett, who's gonna be introducing the first of the awards. Ian, over to you. Thank you, Helen. Um, it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, I, I'm here to uh, announce the Creative Solutions Award, which recognizes the project with the highest degree of interdisciplinary thinking to mobilize and engage communities to act on the SDGs. Uh, this team will be receiving uh, $1,000 Canadian uh, to uh, further and implement uh, the SDG project uh, that is, uh, uh, that's been selected uh, through uh, uh, this process. And uh, I'm pleased to announce uh, that uh, the award, the Creative Solutions Award will be going to uh, Group 8 uh, with a project promoting helpful attitudes, harm reduction, and drug use in the <laughs> Um, as we heard earlier, uh, uh, the the purpose uh, here is to away, uh, raise awareness among youth and the benefits of harm reduction as mean to reduce the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C among drug users uh, through a toolbox of awareness raising and policy advocacy materials for harm reduction. Uh, the committee noted that uh, the knowledge of many of these issues is very strong. Uh, and through this focus on uh, the policy and awareness raising approach, uh, that it was a, a, a very interesting way of looking at this social intersectional issue uh, that included many aspects of excellent collaboration throughout the plan. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, Ian, and congratulations to the group um, who work on this wonderful project. And now we come to the next uh, award, and I'm I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Philip Kelly to introduce the SDGs in Partnership Award. Philip, thank you, Helen. Uh, it's great to be here on behalf of the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Obviously, the SDGs are very central to what we do and what we think about in in our faculty. So I was really impressed and inspired to see all of the projects. As Helen mentioned, I was one of the 
judging panel and to see all of the projects lined up and the the collaboration, the partnership, the action orientation was was really wonderful. But I am here to uh, present the SDGs in Partnership Award, and that's awarded to the project that demonstrates outstanding collaboration and community engagement. Um, this uh, award, I'll put you out of your suspense, is going to group, um, actually, I'm not sure what the group one was, it's the Aquifer Group, Water Sanitation, the applause were a little early there, <laughs> uh, Aquifer, or Aquifer, uh, the Water Sanitation Global Case Studies. Um, so this group consists of, you can see on the screen, Alessia Mole, uh, or Mole, uh, Menat Zawa, Wanandi Dominique, Ilias Bassett, Alexis Wilson, mentored by Professor Lea Abayao from the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and by my colleague, Mark Terry, from uh, he's an adjunct faculty here at EUC at York. So congratulations to that group. Um, that group, as you all have already heard um, earlier this morning, is uh, a group that was researching, profiling, and promoting local struggles for clean water uh, and effective sustainable water governance. So it was very much focused on SDG number six. Um, it was using infographics and other media to popularize struggles in indigenous communities in Canada, uh, on Lake Simcoe in Southern Ontario, in Flint, Michigan, um, and in Brazil. And the reason we picked it for this award was less what the project attained in terms of partnership but more the potential that I that I identified um, to create cross-learning between these local struggles. Um, so in a sense, it was facilitating online um, the jumping of scales, the crossing of scales, um, both by taking local issues and local struggles to a larger audience, but also by facilitating cross-learning between those um, local local issues and strategies around strategies of mobilization, for example, that were used in different contexts. So in terms of um, a group that was working, uh, a, a larger group, five students that were working together, um, that were looking at four different case studies across the Americas, um, and in terms of the potential for action and partnership, um, we thought that was a, a very worthy a recipient of this award. So congratulations to that group. You canned applause. <laughs> All real applause. Thanks, Philip. Um, congratulations again to the Aquifier uh, group for the SDGs in Partnership Award. And now we come to the best overall project. And I'm so very pleased to introduce our Dean of Lausanne School of Engineering, who will be introducing this award, Professor Jane Goodyear. Thank you for joining us today. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Helen, and lovely to see everyone today. I've been sitting in only for about half an hour, but uh, from what I've uh, heard so far, some of the, the work that has been done has been amazing. And it's so um, awesome to see a global uh, team effort, which is uh, essentially so important to work together to tackle these, um, as we call, wicked problems. So uh, don't do the canned clapping yet, but I'm so pleased to be here to present the best overall SDGs in Action project. And this uh, overall, the best overall project is awarded to the project that achieved meaningful action towards the SDG, exhibiting strong intercultural and interdisciplinary collaboration, and also a sense of community. And the team, uh, the winning team, will be receiving a 3,000 Canadian dollars to further and implement the, uh, the project itself. So, drum roll. Da, 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 da. So, the best overall SDGs in Action project goes to Group Four. So, congratulations, Group Four. 
And as you can see, the, uh, the title is the Madawaska Food Bank Website Improvement Project. And it's so great to see, as I say, a global uh, effort from uh, York University in Canada, but also uh, the USA, Chile and the United Kingdom. And so congratulations to all the team members, which is Colin Maitland, Heba Sundhu, Gurjit Tor, Nabanita Manjumba, Jose Ignacio Reyes, and also thank you so much to the mentors because we know how um, important mentoring uh, as you go along a project uh, for its success. So thank you to Sadia Malik and Kevin McKeening. And just to summarize, the, the project was um, tackling with food insecurity. And as we know uh, daily now through the news, food insecurity affects both developed and developing countries because population growth is positively correlated with food insecurity and water scarcity. And food banks are at the forefront of addressing food insecurity challenges and are crucial for many communities around the world. And Group 4 partnered with the Madawaska Valley Food Bank in Ontario, as well as a digital company to help the Madawaska Valley community and the surrounding communities within the Renfrew County in increasing exposure, marketing and accessibility for the food bank. Through an improved website platform that supports community members in need, volunteers and donors, Group 4 contributes to the reduction in poverty, hunger and inequities, and thus contribute to their health and wellbeing. So on behalf of York University, thank you so much for um, doing such an awesome project and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane, and congratulations again for the three groups, to the three groups who received this top awards. And of course, congratulations to all the groups who have contributed to this year's project. Um, I want to invite just maybe before we do the acknowledgments, um, a photo op with the with the winning groups and our senior leaders. If we can have that uh, for one minute, may I invite um, the groups who won. So if we can have them turn on their camera and I'm gonna ask our team here to take a couple of photos. Are we good? Congratulations teams. Great, did we get that? Iris, are you gonna take the picture? Where are you? Yep, take it, yes. Okay, count a sound. Okay, I took lots. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure everyone's not blinking. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, bye. bye. Thank you very nice for doing a spectacular job. Uh, and yeah, you know, shepherding all the projects through it. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Ellen, thank you, Mary Rose, thank you, Juan Maria. Uh, well done. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, and congratulations. So now we come to our acknowledgement and recognition of all people involved. Um, and so I just wanted to share the students. Again, thank you for your engagement. Um, it is wonderful to see all of your efforts and you coming together to contribute to the SDGs this year. And of course, our mentors as well. Um, we, and of, of course, our mentors and our partners as well. If we move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we're not going to read it, but we just want to make sure that everyone is recognized. Thank you. And uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, our Pan University team, um, without whom or without them, this second year cohort will not be possible. So I just want to congratulate my colleagues 
Uh, particularly, I want to congratulate and thank Ana Maria Martinez, who actually served as the lead um, team member or the leader for this year's uh, project or program. So Ana Maria, thank you for your efforts. Um, Mary Rose, of course, our Pan University team representing our faculties, Katie Gribbons, who's here. Julie, I know she's traveling. Hugo was here or is here. Mitch um, and Theo uh, from our La Salle School of Engineering and School Schulich School of Business. And of course, all the other team members who are part of making this program possible. Our student staff, Iris, who has been connecting with you. Um, our team from York International supporting behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, Ashley, Sarah Jane, Shirley, and our communications team. Thank you everyone for all of your efforts and contribution. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Helen. If we can go to the next slide, please. So um, we want to invite you to share this information with your colleagues um, and networks. We will be making um, the call for applications in uh, spring. So you will be receiving an invitation. And so please distribute these um, widely. And of course, uh, to remind you that the participation for the students, for the Canadian students is, uh, allows them to also go and study abroad and to participate in different types of um, exchanges and programs. So we, we want to encourage all the students to, to try and participate. This is a, a great opportunity for everyone. And so we will be posting updates on our website, which we're uh, working on right now. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to, to let us know. Uh, as you know, we make the call for not only students, but also mentors. And so you will be receiving both calls um, shortly. If we can go to the next slide, please. And of course, we want you to know that there are many uh, mobility opportunities for the students uh, at York. And so please uh, check our website. The link is at the bottom of, the, of this slide and uh, deadlines are coming up. So please uh, make sure that you revise these frequently. And I think that we are almost coming to an end. If we can move to the next one. Yes, thank you so much for attending and we hope to uh, keep in touch and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, thanks everyone to our colleagues from the UIT and our interpreters, Mary Rose specifically, I wanna thank you for supporting the group projects. Um, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you everybody. This was a really, really good experience. And I, I, wanted to I did have, have a lot of fun. So have a good, have a good day everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you, Grant and team for, for your work.